Hey everyone, welcome back. Before we dive into the stories, I want to issue a few warnings. Story number two involves mentions of murder, and story number three discusses sexual abuse. I'll also include these warnings with timestamps in the pinned comment below. That said, let's jump into these stories. And remember, stay hungry. In the late 90s and early 2000s, my grandfather worked as a police officer in our small town. Not much typically happened there, just the occasional drug bust, but nothing could have prepared him for this particular encounter. One day, while on patrol, he noticed a vehicle swerving and driving recklessly. He activated his lights and pulled the van over. As he approached the window, he identified himself and explained why he had pulled over the two Hispanic men. He mentioned their reckless driving and a malfunctioning brake light. However, when my grandfather made this observation, the passenger in the vehicle spoke up. He asked if he could open the rear hatch and check the brake light. My grandfather, being a skilled mechanic, agreed to take a look, but he informed them that he needed to run a check on the driver's license and insurance first. As he relayed the driver's name to dispatch, the dispatcher's response was frantic. She urgently advised him to stay in his vehicle until backup arrived. A few minutes later, backup units arrived on the scene and conducted a thorough search of the vehicle. To my grandfather's astonishment, both men in the van were armed with shotguns. He hadn't seen the weapons, because they had cleverly blocked the windows on both sides of the van. It turned out that they were smuggling drugs from Mexico into the United States. For privacy and safety reasons, I'll omit specific details, such as exact dates, names, and locations. This story isn't mine, but my dad's, from a time before I was born when he was a young cop. He doesn't often share these stories, and I recall him opening up about them almost a decade ago after my first assignment. He hasn't spoken about them much since. I believe he'd be comfortable with me sharing this story, as long as I keep certain personal details private. Sharing it may help people better understand the challenges many law enforcement officers face. For now, I'll share this one, and perhaps in the future, I'll share more stories, either from his experiences or my own. Please note that I've compiled this account not only from my own recollections of what my dad told me, but also from local newspaper articles. As I mentioned earlier, my dad served as a police officer for nearly 30 years. During that time, he fulfilled various roles, from being a regular beat cop to working with the SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics Team, including serving as a sniper or sharpshooter. He also worked undercover with the Drug Task Force and had other assignments. The story I'm about to share takes place in the early 90s, late at night, in a rural Midwestern town. Picture a small town with a few thousand residents, surrounded by vast farmland and a couple of even smaller towns with just a few hundred people each. As many of you from such areas may know, everyone knows everyone. And these remote areas are often hotspots for methamphetamine production and distribution. Due to their seclusion and the availability of chemicals required for manufacturing. This particular area was no different. In this story, I'll refer to two brothers as John and Mike Smith. Over the years, especially John, had developed a reputation for violent behavior, possibly stemming from some form of mental illness. In addition to their involvement in meth production, John was known for physically and verbally abusing his girlfriend. There was even an incident where he held some family members at gunpoint and threatened suicide. Both brothers had frequent encounters with the law and were on probation at the
the time of this story, one of the stipulations of their probation was that they weren't allowed to be in each other's company. At some point, one of the brothers had obtained a Tech-9 pistol. Rumor had it that they had illegally modified it to fire in full auto mode. A few days before the events of this story, Mike had purchased several rounds of 9mm ammunition from a local sporting goods store. Now, on to the night of the incident. My dad was out on patrol on his motorcycle. Earlier, they had received reports that John and Mike were together, despite the probationary restrictions. My dad spotted them driving together and attempted to pull them over after activating his lights. However, the two brothers decided to flee, leading to a high-speed chase. During the chase, my dad remained remarkably calm as he relayed the situation over the radio. The pursuit eventually led to Mike's house, where both brothers got out of the car and tried to make a run for it. John managed to reach the front porch and enter the house. In contrast, my dad caught up to Mike on the front porch. A physical struggle ensued as my dad tried to subdue Mike. Unexpectedly, John re-emerged from the front door holding the Tech-9 pistol. At this moment, both sides of my dad's and Mike's bodies were facing John, who pointed the gun at my dad's head. Fortunately, my dad spotted John out of the corner of his eye and noticed the gun's muzzle, which was barely a foot from his head. Without hesitation, my dad acted on pure instinct. He turned Mike in front of John using him as a shield, and simultaneously drew his own pistol. He aimed it at John, ready to respond to the imminent threat. As soon as John pointed the Tech-9 at my dad's head, my dad acted swiftly, squeezing off a round towards John over Mike's shoulder. John immediately collapsed to the ground, allowing my dad to bring Mike to the ground and handcuff him. My dad urgently radioed, shots fired, and mentioned that one suspect was down. I distinctly recall that he sounded out of breath, not yelling or panicking over the radio, but speaking louder, clearly stressed, while still maintaining his composure. Backup units soon arrived. In a small town, word travels fast, especially about a shooting incident. John's family attempted to claim that my dad had murdered him, and, as expected, the entire incident had to undergo a thorough investigation. During the investigation, one of John's friends even claimed to have seen my dad drunk at the local bar, bragging about shooting John. However, everyone who knew my dad could vouch for the fact that he didn't drink. He had never consumed alcohol in his life. In fact, it had become a running joke among his friends, and they would teasingly give him a hard time about it from time to time. Furthermore, no one else could corroborate the story, rendering the claim baseless. After a thorough investigation, it was determined that the shooting was indeed justified. Naturally, John's friends and family were displeased with the outcome. Sometimes, it's difficult to accept that the people you care about might not always make the best choices and bring trouble upon themselves. Perhaps it's easier to live in denial. I can't say for sure. I'm not them, and I haven't lived through the same experiences they have. As I mentioned earlier, I wasn't even born when this incident took place. Regardless, they decided to produce and distribute bumper stickers that read, Remember John Smith. The local newspaper also published an article about the investigation, stating that the shooting had been deemed justified. In the article, there was a photo of both my dad and John. At the time, they were both in their late twenties. My dad stood at six, four tall with a classic cop mustache 
weighing around 220 pounds of muscle. He had always been passionate about fitness and was a former state champion high hurdler before becoming a police officer. He even received a full ride D1 track scholarship. The newspaper made sure to use a photo of him in uniform, highlighting not only his physical attributes, but also capturing the most serious expression on his face. On the other hand, John, also in his late twenties, was of average height, standing at around 5'10", due to his extensive use of meth and other drugs throughout his life. He appeared thin with emaciated skin, matted oily hair, and most of his teeth missing. John, on the other hand, had a vastly different appearance. He stood around 5'10", and due to his prolonged use of meth and other substances, appeared thin with emaciated skin. His hair was typically unkempt, oily, and matted. Most of his teeth had either rotted away or were missing, contributing to his disheveled appearance. Interestingly, the newspaper chose to use his old high school senior picture, taken around a decade earlier, where he was captured with a joyful smile. Years later, Mike ended up in prison, and upon his release, he made threats against my dad stating that he intended to kill him and then take his own life. However, he passed away from a heart attack or similar ailment, never acting on his threat. My dad eventually retired from the force after nearly 30 years of service. In the years immediately following his retirement, he appeared somewhat downcast, even though he disliked the internal politics associated with being a police officer. He had a genuine love for the job itself. Eventually, he relocated to a new city and began working at a halfway house, serving as a counselor and running a program for veterans dealing with PTSD. Since embarking on this new path, it became evident that he had found a renewed sense of purpose. He often mentioned that his favorite aspect of this work was witnessing the progress made by these veterans and helping them overcome setbacks along the way. Many of them continued to seek him out years later, expressing gratitude for his unwavering belief in their potential when no one else, including themselves, had. Some of them have even crossed paths with me, echoing the same sentiments. It's clear that the residents at the halfway house hold him in high regard, viewing him as a father figure or an older sibling they never had. What's truly fascinating is that he credits his time and experiences as a cop for enabling him to relate to and understand the people he counsels. During his early days as a rookie cop, his field training officer imparted a valuable lesson. Most of the so-called bad people you'll encounter in your career are actually individuals who've made some really bad decisions, but they're still fundamentally good people. You'll encounter truly evil individuals, but they're the exception, not the rule. This wisdom has stayed with him throughout his life and guides his interactions with the people he helps. In closing, stay safe out there, everyone. Now, let's continue with the next part of the story. When I was in high school, I stumbled upon a stolen car, which I promptly reported to the police. This discovery could have led to something far worse. Every day after school, I followed my usual routine of heading upstairs to use the bathroom as my room was on the second floor. At that time, there was no shade or curtain on the bathroom window. It was a habit I didn't think much about. I would simply go upstairs, attend to my business, and occasionally glance out the window. From that vantage point, I could see our backyard 
and over the fence to a parking lot near some nearby apartments. One day, as I casually glanced out the window, something caught my eye. At the far end of the parking lot, there was a car with the driver's side window wide open. This struck me as odd, especially considering the heavy snowfall from the previous night. The entire car was covered in snow, except for that one open window. I chuckled to myself, thinking it might be an older car with a malfunctioning or broken window. Alternatively, someone might have parked it there while intoxicated and simply forgot to roll up the window. Various thoughts raced through my mind as I pondered the possible reasons for such an anomaly during the winter. However, after several days had passed, I noticed that the car remained in the same spot and the window was still wide open. A growing sense of unease crept over me and I began to suspect that the car had been stolen and abandoned there. Deciding to be a good Samaritan, I jotted down the make, model, and license plate number of the car. I then took this information to our high school's police liaison officer. The high school's liaison officer's office had its window covered with black construction paper to ensure privacy when students or staff needed to discuss matters with the officer. When I brought the information about the suspicious car to him, I had to wait because he was in a meeting with another student at the time, and my knocks went unanswered. Faced with no other choice, I had to go to my class and entrusted a friend to deliver the information to the officer later. Later that day, I received a summons to the school foyer where I found both the liaison officer and a uniformed officer. As it turned out, the car I had reported was indeed stolen, and the uniformed officer was there to accompany me to the location of the car. The school excused me from my classes, and I rode with the officer to my neighborhood to show him the car's whereabouts. After providing my information to the officer for the report, the liaison officer, who had met up with us later, drove me back to school. This is when things took an unsettling turn. For some background context, I had always harbored suspicions about the liaison officer, even before I brought in the stolen car information. I had observed him being overly friendly with students, and many students liked him and engaged in joking banter with him. He made questionable jokes and remarks often crossing the line of appropriateness. For instance, he once asked, if you went camping and woke up with your butt hurting, would you tell anyone? Some students who were fond of him would brush off these comments as harmless banter, treating him like just one of the guys who was joking around and having a good time. Despite my reservations, I had shrugged it off given that many students seemed to vouch for him. During the drive back to school, he asked, So, what do you have planned for this weekend? I was naturally nervous, as I'm generally a shy person, and I gave him a serious but somewhat ridiculous response. I told him I was getting an oil change for my car. He chuckled and suggested that I must have more exciting plans than that. I chuckled too, but didn't provide any further details since I didn't have any specific plans for the weekend. He then offered to buy me lunch from a fast food place located just a block away from the school, a popular destination for high schoolers during off-campus lunch breaks. At the time, I assumed that perhaps it was some sort of reward for finding and reporting the stolen car. Looking back, it appears he may have been trying to groom me with the offer of food and friendly gestures. Several months after reporting the stolen car, news broke out about the liaison officer. A moment. The entire interaction didn't last longer than two minutes, so I didn't consider his questions to be inappropriate. 
he didn't even request to see my driver's license, which struck me as odd. After a brief pause, he abruptly turned and gestured for me to follow him, still trying to be cooperative and not wanting any trouble. I obediently followed his lead. We walked a short distance away from my van, and he motioned for me to stand near a dimly lit alley. At this point, unease began to settle in, but my inexperience and naivety kept me from questioning his actions. He continued speaking in French, but I still couldn't comprehend his words. I awkwardly explained that I didn't understand French very well, and he seemed to become even more anxious. At this moment, he reached into his pocket and pulled out what looked like a badge, flashing it briefly before tucking it away. Now I began to feel a growing sense of unease. Despite not understanding what was happening, I knew this situation didn't seem right. My instincts started to kick in, and I realized that his behavior was far from normal. My heart raced as I considered the possibilities of what could unfold. Suddenly, he made a series of hand gestures indicating that he needed me to do something. Still, I couldn't discern his intentions. He seemed agitated and impatient, which only heightened my discomfort. Panic began to set in as I weighed my options. In that moment, a car approached, and its headlights illuminated the area. The sudden visibility seemed to startle the man. He looked around nervously, then quickly muttered something in French before disappearing into the darkness. Without hesitation, I rushed back to my van and locked the doors, my heart pounding in my chest. I realized that I had narrowly escaped a potentially dangerous situation. It was clear that this man had not been a legitimate police officer, and I couldn't help but shudder at the thought of what might have happened if the approaching car hadn't intervened. From that day on, I became more cautious and less trusting, understanding the importance of following my instincts and not ignoring warning signs. Moment, he poked his head through my driver's window and glanced behind me at the empty van. He appeared unsettled by the lack of any suspicious findings and simply instructed me to go home. On the way back, I assumed he was an undercover police officer who might have been on the lookout for a similar looking vehicle and believed he had found it. This explanation seemed plausible to me at the time and I thought nothing more of the incident. However, one day I was casually sharing my experience with my coworkers, laughing about the strange encounter. To my surprise, their expressions turned serious and they stared at me intently. They proceeded to inform me that white vans were often used by prostitutes who offered their services in the back. The man who had pulled me over might have been a legitimate police officer, or he might have been an imposter seeking to exploit a sex worker. When he realized that I didn't speak French and didn't fit the usual description of a sex worker, he may have taken a closer look inside my van to verify his suspicions. Upon finding no evidence to support his assumptions, he backed off. Needless to say, this revelation left me terrified. The man could have genuinely been a police officer, but I was left with a lingering unease, realizing how close I had come to a potentially dangerous situation. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if he wasn't a genuine police officer and if he truly had sinister intentions towards some vulnerable individual. As a result of this experience, I've since adopted a more cautious approach when being pulled over. I no longer roll down my windows entirely until I've confirmed that the person stopping me is indeed a police officer. 
before engaging in any conversation. Additionally, I've chosen to avoid driving a white van altogether. Hey everyone, that's about it for today's stories. If you have your own story that you'd like to share, you can send it to hi.com comma, or you can email it to hiogmail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing your stories. Have a good night or day, everyone. And remember to always stay safe. In closing, I want to express my gratitude to all of you for sharing these captivating stories with us. They serve as a reminder that life can be filled with unexpected twists and turns. And it's crucial to trust our instincts and prioritize our safety. If you have your own story to share, or if you've been inspired by these narratives, please don't hesitate to send it in. Your stories are a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, and they may help others navigate their own challenges. As we conclude for today, I encourage each of you to stay vigilant, trust your instincts, and continue sharing your experiences with the world. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember to stay safe and stay hungry for knowledge and adventure.